It's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome everyone to the first uh, uh, lunchtime lecture uh, of this um, academic year. Uh, I'm uh, Nathan Hill, I'm professor in Chinese studies and, um, and director of the Trinity Center for Asian Studies. Uh, but my role here is just to, uh, to uh, welcome uh, Julia Schneider, uh, who, uh, who is today's speaker. Uh, and she um, is a professor in Chinese history at Cork. Uh, and her talk is called, uh, Who Belongs to the Chinese Nation? Inclusion and uh, Exclusion in Chinese Republican Historiography. Uh, and with that said, then I um, will uh, disappear and let her uh, give her presentation. Um, thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Let me first share my my slides because I do have some slides. They are um, they are really only to illustrate some of the things I'm going to say. They are not really my content is is in the talk and not not so much in the slides. Um, yeah, I want to talk about the question who belongs to the Chinese nation and about how different people or peoples living in China are included or excluded in Chinese historiography in Republican times. Um, now the situation of non-Han Chinese or non-Chinese citizens in the People's Republic of China, as you probably well know, con uh, continues to provoke controversies both, with, both within and outside the PRC, the People's Republic of China, regarding issues of ethnic identity as well as of political self-determination. And for many decades, scholars have analyzed how the Chinese majority society approaches its ethnic minorities, its so-called ethnic minorities, based on ethnocentric chauvinism, and of course also on assimilation theories. I would argue that such ethnocentric or sinocentric attitudes have derived from dichotomous hierarchical concepts of superior Chinese self on the one hand and inferior non-Chinese other on the other hand that date back centuries. And they were strengthened and, and complemented though in Republican times when nationalist images of China needed to be legitimized. So in this, in this lecture, I aim to shed light on how Chinese historiography in the first half of the 20th century uh, was complicit in nationalist approaches towards non-Chinese people living within the claimed territory of the Republic of China or actually living in the territory of the Qing Empire before its downfall. Let me also say that here I understand relations between texts on a given topic, such as the approaches to non-Chinese peoples in Chinese historiography as a discourse according to Foucault's idea of discourse and of apparatus, or also called dispositive. This apparatus is ultimately, to use Foucault's own words, of a strategic nature to influence and to use power relations that is a cluster of relations, and I quote him again, more or less organized, hierarchical, coordinated. Here it is moreover significant to mention that Foucault links the apparatus or dispositive to, and I quote again, certain coordinates of knowledge which issue from the apparatus, but to an equal degree condition it, the apparatus being the discourse. Um, in my talk, I give particular attention to how the theory of China's assimilative power or the assimilation theory facilitated an integration of non-Chinese peoples as on the one hand marginal, but on the other hand, firm parts of China's history, as well as of, China, of the Chinese nation and the territory of China. Already in late Qing times, Sinocentric, that is uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, Sinocentric attitudes towards non-Chinese peoples increasingly dominated the discourse among Chinese thinkers. Although this discourse was of course mainly about China's present and China's future, it included analysis of the past that were supposed to contain value for the present and future. And that this was of course a very traditional Chinese approach. Ethnocentric attitudes 
actually went against um, official Qing policy, which was based on the so-called Altaic model, a term phrased by Peter Perdue in his analysis of, of, inner Asia, of Qing inner Asia, and a strategy of simultaneous rule, uh, a term coined by Pamela Crossley. Um, and particularly the strategy of simultaneous rule was intended to strengthen and ethnify distinct identities. It goes beyond the scope of my lecture today to dwell on Qing ethnification. So suffice to say here, the Qing emperors emphasized the Manchus, Mongols, uh, Chinese, Tibetans, to a certain degree, Turkic Muslims known as Uyghurs today, as the pillars of their empire, because these four, or if you want five peoples occupied prominent positions regarding territory, regarding politics, religion, language, loyalty, and culture. Moreover, these four or five peoples, alleged or real forefathers, had founded powerful khanats, powerful kingdoms and empires in the past. So based on these two preconditions, that is on the one hand, the Qing ethnification project, and on the other hand, the histories of powerful empires related to these four or five peoples, it was actually not unlikely that in the political upheaval of late Qing times that were charged with nationalist aspirations, all these five people would actually aim at individual nation building projects, dividing the Qing empire's geobody. So I will analyze how non-Chinese peoples were approached and integrated in um, Republican uh, general, so-called general histories, uh, which was originally a European genre, and is largely equivalent with history textbooks. My analysis show that therein, the Chinese assimilation theory was a basic assumption. Um, I will focus on, um, or my sources actually, are more than a dozen general histories and also cultural histories, which is a genre very closely related to general histories, as well as essays that focus on topics of ethnicities and assimilation in China. My analysis has brought to the four patterns of Republican historical narratives that show the discursive manifestation and the hardening of approaches toward non-Chinese peoples that originated in late imperial times and then were continued in Republican times. Of course, the intimate relationship between nationalist agendas on the one hand and constructions of history is on the other hand is visible from the time when nationalism developed as a political theory in the late 18th and then particularly in the 19th century. And this has often been analyzed by historians of nationalism regarding Europe, and it has also been studied intensively for China. However, the issue of Chinese nationalist approaches toward non-Chinese peoples and their entanglement with historiography, in particular the assimilation theory and its widespread influence on Republican historical narratives has not been analyzed thoroughly until recently. Here, I would like to further develop recent findings by broadening the corpus of sources to analyze the assimilation theory's development and its consolidation in the first half of the 20th century. I argue that um, Chinese nation building was ultimately advocated as a project of George Agamben's exclusive inclusion that identified non-Chinese people in the category of people without history or non-historic people lacking in legitimacy to pursue individual nation building projects and position them in a permanent state of exception, Ausnahmezustand, also a term that um, Agamben regularly uses in his um, analysis or, or, or um, approach. In the texts I refer to here, um, the general histories, cultural histories and historical essays, the Manchus, Mongols, Tibetans, etc., are constructed as the opposite, the non-self or the other of the Chinese people. And they are united, so to speak, in, in a certain conceptual otherness. I think it is therefore justifiable to apply the term non-Chinese, although it's not used in the sources. The sources usually refer to them individually, but, but bundle them together. In the end, of course, ethnic and other identities are constructions by oneself by, and by others that cannot ultimately be manifested objectively, although these concepts are also not totally random, of course. So the structure of my talk um, 
is as follows. I will first refer to the roots of um, nationalist thinking and particularly of um, the assimilation theory in late imperial times. Um, then tell how these approaches were consolidated in Republican historiography. And finally say a few words about the terms I've used just now of historic versus non-historic peoples and how that came to be part of Republican approaches to non-Chinese peoples. And then I will give a short conclusion if time allows that is. Now, um, during the so-called century of humiliation from the second um, Opium War until the end of the Chinese Civil War in 1949, Chinese self-confidence, so to speak, was profoundly challenged. Um, in this regard, however, self-confidence is measured against external others. That is particularly the imperialist states, the European, the European imperialists, as well as Russia and Japan and, and the US. However, a certain assumption of Chinese superiority vis-a-vis -vis internal, internal others, that is non-Chinese peoples within the Qing empire, remained intact. This idea of Chinese superiority was informed by pre-nationalist or proto-nationalist sinocentric culturalism. In general, culturalism is a ethnocentric way of imagining the world as well as the self and the other which many scholars understand as having been shared by most Chinese thinkers, at, late, at least in late imperial times. Culturalism usually denies the existence of other cultures and accepts only the self's culture. So consequently, others who want to become cultured or civilized have to turn to this one culture and they have to transform themselves or in other words, assimilate in order to become part, of, to become civilized. So culturalism usually upholds a seemingly inclusive concept of a culture that is open for others to join, but at the same time, it constructs a dichotomy of cultivated self versus barbarian other. So as long as the barbarian other does not assimilate to the self's culture, the barbarian will forever remain barbarian. So he cannot become civilized or cultured without assimilation. Now, in the late 19th century, European sociopolitical concepts like nationalism, social Darwinism, and of course also pseudoscientific racism, and also historical concepts like linear progressivism, universalism, and historicism traveled, so to speak, to China, often via Japan. So Japanese intellectuals, um, since the Meiji reform in the 19th century, um, translated German, French, English um, works on, on European philosophy, political thought, etc., into Japanese using a lot of kanji characters. So it was pretty easy for Chinese um, thinkers to read these texts and to translate them for either translate them into classical Chinese or into Chinese or, or just read them in their Japanese form. Chinese political thinkers at that time were convinced that the Qing Empire needed political reforms or even a revolution, otherwise it would be unable to survive the imperialist threats. And however, if the Qing Empire managed to become a Chinese nation state, either by reform as a constitutional monarchy or by a revolution to, uh, to become a republic, they argued, China could indeed rank alongside the most powerful imperialist nation states due to his size, due to its long history and its uh, large um, population. European concepts also continue, contributed indirectly to the late Qing revival of anti-Manchuism initiated by Chinese scholar officials, particularly by so-called statecraft scholars. Um, Anti-Manchuism is a, a, a feeling or later also a movement directed against the emperors, the dynasty of the Qing Empire, which was of course founded and ruled by non-Chinese peoples, by Manchu peoples um, and by the Manchu Qing emperors. This revival of anti-Manchuism became more powerful when thinkers like Zhang Taiyan and Liu Shipei and also others legitimized anti-Manchuist claims with uh, social Darwinist and racialist justifications, explaining that the Manchu emperors belonged to a race that was just unfit to rule. And this, of course, comes from, from social Darwinist ideas of, uh, of 
of human beings. Such conceptualizations of self and other form the roots of the later Chinese discourse on non-Chinese peoples as expressed in historiography. In a Foucauldian sense, to come back to something I said at the beginning, these conceptualizations were part of a so-called largely silent development that presupposed the discourse on nationalism, informing nationalist concepts of identity that would become powerful later. Now, around 1900, the concept of nationalism, or it, as it should actually be more precisely translated, ethno-nationalism, minzujui, entered the Chinese political discourse. There was actually also a term for state nationalism, guajiajui, which was rather popular in Japan, but it never became very popular among Chinese thinkers who, who tended to use minzujui. Many political thinkers began to engage in discussions whether the Chinese people constituted a nation, and if so, who actually belonged to this Chinese nation? So who was China? What was China? Most shared two fundamental assumptions. First, we already heard, heard about that. The Chinese were superior to the non-Chinese peoples, particularly those in their closest surroundings, living with them in the Qing Empire. And second, the strength of a nation depended on its level of homogeneity. Different conclusions were drawn from these two assumptions in relation to the question if the non-Chinese peoples in the Qing Empire should actually be included into a future Chinese nation state. And two um, different schemes were paramount. The first scheme, which was ultimately less influential, was exclusion. Some thinkers argued that the Qing Empire was to be divided so that an exclusive Chinese nation state could be established in the borders of so-called China proper, um, also called the 18 provinces. So it's usually a, a loose reference to the former uh, territory of the Ming dynasty. We could also say China proper refers to the regions that are um, uh, inhabited by people speaking Chinese languages. The second scheme was inclusion, a concept as first mostly followed by reformist thinkers who favored the continuation of the Qing empire as a constitutional monarchy, but then also adopted by Republicans. According to this scheme, the Qing empire was to stay territorially intact. All non-Chinese peoples and regions were to be integrated into the future Chinese nation state, but also assimilated into Chinese culture because national homogeneity supposedly enhanced political and social equality and stability. One of the most prominent formulations of the assimilation theory can be found in Liang Qichao's texts on the Swiss political thinker, Johann Kaspar Blunschli, and you can see the two here, Liang Qichao and Johann Kaspar Blunschli. Liang published his text in 1903, and actually it was rather word for word um, translation of a Japanese essay about Blunschli with a lot of word-for-word -word quotations from Blunschli's text. Liang believed that the Chinese were able to assimilate others even when they, have, when they were conquered by them. And this indeed was Liang's theory of the special assimilative power of China, Zhongguo Tonghuali, a combination of social Darwinist and culturalist ideas. Liang gave several criteria that according to him constituted a nation and they it sound actually pretty familiar. He said um, nation, a nation was, sorry. Huh? Okay. Um, was constituted by criteria such as place, blood relation, physical appearance, language, script, religion, customs, and way of living. However, he mainly understood assimilation as happening in the fields of language, scripts, and customs. So if non-Chinese people adopted Chinese language and script and customs, they would actually be assimilated to the Chinese. Famously, Liang rejected ideas of exclusion and popular Chinese sentiments towards other domestic ethnicities like the Manchus, Mongols, Tibetans, etc., merely reflected what he called lesser or petty nationalism, whereas greater nationalism, da means ujui, was the feeling that all domestic nations could learn to share towards foreign nations. He also argued that the, the Chinese could use their assimilative power in order to form one greater nation, Da Minzu, 
together with the non-Chinese. However, it was always cl clear for Liang Qichao that the Chinese would be the, at, at, the, at the center of this Chinese nation, would lead this Chinese nation. However, by uniting with the non-Chinese people, the China could defend herself against foreign threats and moreover, become the largest and most powerful nation in the world. That was Liang's dream. Liang saw assimilation basically as a teleological progression of an ancient old development that according to him continued with or without the consent of the non-Chinese people. It was just inevitable or automatic that non-Chinese people would assimilate due to the um, great power of Chinese culture. So due to their historical excellence in advancing civilization, the Chinese people were nominated to assume a leading or central position in the project of nation building. Other thinkers, to name just one of the very, very few thinkers who had a different opinion, um, uh, other thinkers like Wang Jingwei criticized the ambiguity of Liang, who claimed that the Manchus were assimilated, but still referred to them as a people distinct from the Chinese. And this is actually one of the main problems of the assimilation theory, um, uh, which makes this theory some kind of a circular theory. Wang pointed out that Chinese and Manchus did not belong to the same nation, and he doubted that the latter could assimilate into the Chinese nation. This was related to Wang Jingwei's um, definition of a nation. Actually, his criteria are very similar to the ones I've listed here from Lang Liang Qichao, but Wang Jingwei put um, emphasis on historical relations, and according to him, the historical relations of Manchus and Chinese were just too, um, too unequal. So they, they, they didn't share historical relations in a way that made them one nation or that made them likely to assimilate. Let me now come to my, my second part, the consolidation of the assimilation theory in Republican historiography. I think it has become clear that before 1911, images of the Chinese nation were influenced by the wish for national homogeneity. Influential political thinkers and intellectuals, and I've just introduced Liang Qichao, but there were others as well, of course, published analysis of Chinese history, often using history to make a case for contemporary political issues, particularly for the exclusion or the inclusion of non-Chinese territories into a Chinese nation state. Now, in the time of political and territorial fragmentation after the Xinhai Revolution in 1911-1912, the narratives of inclusive nationalism finally prevailed over exclusive schemes. One reason for this were probably security considerations, um, which made inclusion appear rather appealing uh, in contrast to exclusion. Another cause, however, was that over the course of the 19th century, as Matthew Mosca has shown in an article from uh, 2011 very convincingly, um, Chinese literati had begun to imagine the non-Chinese regions of the Qing Empire as part of the inner lands, the Nei Di, of the empire. Also, finally, the perception of a somewhat geographical, or as Liang Qichao called it, natural great unity of the Qing territory contributed to the broad acceptance of the inclusive scheme. Of course, this geographical unity was, was a construction. If you look at China, it's actually not that, that logical, but, but Liang Qichao found it convincing. In the inclusive scheme, national homogeneity in turn required, sorry, that non-Chinese peoples assimilated, whatever that finally meant. We can see that the assimilation theory had fully entered the political discourse by looking at Sun Yat-sen's approach to non-Chinese peoples. In one of his famous San Min Zhui texts, this one from 1919, it's not as well known as the one from 1924, Sun Yat-sen argued that a penta-ethnic understanding of the nation, as suggested by the, so, by the theory of unity of the five races or five ethnicities, and of course symbolized in the five-colored national flag, was disruptive to national unity. So Sun Yat-sen actually had not been in favor of adopting this five-colored flag, but he had actually opted for another, but was, was overruled. So despite the conceptual haziness of the assimilation theory, because it never actually becomes really clear what is concretely meant by assimilation, how this is concretely, uh, how this could be concretely managed by the state, 
Republican historians adopted the concept. Particularly histories of non-Chinese dynasties, later they were to be called foreign conquest dynasties, were narrated as processes of assimilation. And thereby a case was made, of course, for China's assimilative power, as Liang Qichao had explained it. So his, his basic argument had been, even if foreign conquerors conquered Chinese regions, they, in the end, assimilated to the Chinese and not the other way around, was his argument. The 1910s and 1920s represent a crucial period of political transition paralleled in the production of and education in Chinese history. In late imperial times, Chinese thinkers believed that the main task of historiography was to answer which ethnicities constituted the Chinese nation and which regions constituted the Chinese nation state. After 1911, politics had theoretically answered both questions. However, assimilation and integration of non-Chinese peoples and regions did of course not happen automatically and was not an inevitable process. Neither the Beiyang regime nor the Nanjing government had the resources, financial, militarily, political resources to execute assimilative policies in practice. Nevertheless, the official agenda propagated the idea of national unity and of homogeneity based on assimilation. As in many new nation states everywhere around the world, history and historiography were intrinsically entangled with political demands and were thus essential to the nation building process. Consequently, the political ideas, idea of non-Chinese people's assimilation into the Chinese nation and their inclusion um, and particularly the inclusion of non-Chinese histories into China's national history informed and legitimized each other. Um, Republican historiographical approaches towards non-Chinese peoples show how knowledge and knowledge production and power were mutually constitutive. Chinese historians discursively integrated non-Chinese peoples into the imagined Chinese nation state in their narrations of Chinese national history, and thereby they developed two historiographical patterns. One pattern was that they habitually used the assimilation theory as an authoritative prism to examine the histories of non-Chinese people, and the second pattern was that they generally downplayed and marginalized non-Chinese histories within their historical narratives. And I just put this list here to show whose, whose general histories and historical essays I have, um, I have analyzed. And you can see by the sheer mass of, uh, of sources that this was a pretty general approach. Um, none of these, uh, of, this, um, of these historians listed here, except two, and I will come to them shortly, questioned um, the validity of the assimilation theory and thereby they contributed to sinocentric and ethno-nationalist understandings of history and further manifested, of course, the hierarchical dichotomy of superior Chinese versus inferior non-Chinese cultures and ethnicities. And let me just shortly refer to the two exceptions I've listed here. So very few historians actually argued against the assimilation theory, and there were mainly two, Wang Guowei and Xiang Da. However, neither Wang Guowei nor, nor Xiang Da actually wrote general histories, Tongshi, and so their influence remained confined to specialized historians, so they didn't have a broader influence, they didn't publish um, history textbooks, for example. All the other historians generally followed culturalist understandings of assimilation, that is, they described the adoption of Chinese language, the adoption of Chinese family names, and of dynastic administrative structures as assimilative processes. Um, and this comes again, this comes to the fore in many Republican general histories. By the 1940s, the, the assimilation theory was already believed to be something traditional, a traditional theory to understand Chinese history. And even until today, it continues to be a vital part of China's general histories and particularly of PRC history textbooks, as has been analyzed by, um, by two scholars recently, Baranovich and Lu. Now, Republican general histories narrated the histories of non-Chinese peoples, and in particular, those who founded powerful dynasties 
as processes of absorption into Chinese culture and people. When Liang Titao first formulated the assimilation theory in the early 1900s, he had already referred particularly to the histories of non-Chinese empires, namely of the, the Tapgach or Toaba people, of the Kitan people, the Jurchen and the Manchu people. As is well known, these peoples founded powerful dynasties. The Toaba founded the Northern Wei, and then there were also the Tanguts who founded the Western Xia, the Kitan founded the Liao, the Georgian, the Jin, and of course the Manchus founded the Qing. And all, and of course the Mongols founded the Yuan, but even Liang Qichao wasn't so bold to claim that the, that the, Mon the Mongols had assimilated during their uh, Yuan dynasty. That was an exception from, from the rule. All these dynasties conquered Chinese territories, among other territories actually. Their contact with Chinese cultures was the basis for Liang's assumption that they assimilated into Chinese culture and people. And I quote from Liang Qichao, once the Jin and Qing had entered the Central Plains, their native characteristics disappeared and vanished. Now, characteristic narrative patterns derived from that were, again, first, the marginalization, sorry, um, the marginalization of the Liao, the Western Xia, and the Jin. These were three non-Chinese dynasties that existed parallel to a Chinese dynasty, the Song dynasty. And this marginalization is clearly visible by the stark contrast of number of pages attributed to their histories versus the Song dynasty. And a second pattern was that a general disregard of distinct cultural characteristics and also ruling strategies, particularly of the Mongolian and the Manchu Qing dynasty, two non-Chinese dynasties that ruled alone without a parallel Chinese dynasty. Now, since the Republic of China proclaimed itself as successor to the Qing dynasty, and thus as legitimate inheritor of the Qing empire's territory, the narration of Qing history was of course directly related to the Republican nation building agenda regarding territory and ethnic constituencies, as well as to manifesting the understanding that the Manchus assimilated and that the Qing thus was actually a Chinese dynasty. The Altaic heritage of the Qing, um, heritage from the Timurid or Tamerlan's empire, from the Zunghar Khanate and the Koshut Khanate, was only recently rediscovered by new Qing history scholars and also by empire studies. But Chinese historians would never refer to that at all in Republican times. The other non-Chinese dynasties, the Liao, the Jin, uh, and the Western Xia, and also the Yuan, did not have direct impacts on the nation building, building project. Most general histories, for example, devote one or several chapters to the Liao and Jin dynasties, but these chapters are always shorter than their Song counterparts, and often the Liao and the Jin are even dealt with in only one chapter together, sometimes even lumped together with the Western Xia or the Yuan. Or they are not dealt with in specific chapters at all, but are included in the chapters on and only in relation to the Song. Moreover, the situation of the founding peoples, the George and the Kitan, the Tanguts, etc., before the establishment of their dynasties is described with tropes of culturelessness that is nomadic or semi-nomadic lifestyles, as well as the lack of script, the lack of administrative systems and reeds. At the time of their demise, they either fell back to a non-historic or ahistoric state, or they had, according to the history, historians, had assimilated into the Chinese. Also, cultural histories of China follow this approach pre-nationalist culturalist ideas remain fundamental to the understanding of interactions between Chinese and non-Chinese peoples and the effects of these interactions. Non-Chinese Asian cultures, including Mongol, Manchu, Tibetan, and Turkestani cultures were not thought to have contributed meaningfully to China's culture, Zhongguo Wenhua. And of course, Wenhua also, was also a rather recent concept in, uh, in that, uh, was used only since the late 19th century. So these cultures are usually not even mentioned in chapters on culture 
The only exception was India and particularly Indian Buddhism. And this was explained by the accepted fact that India, like China, had something called high culture in contrast to the other Asian peoples. <clears throat> Let me shortly come to uh, to the to to the to the concept of historic and non-historic people. Um, in Republican general histories, Chinese and non-Chinese peoples are presented in a hierarchical dichotomy, as I've already mentioned, reflecting the pre-nationalist assumption of a sinocentric culturalist hierarchy. Besides its origin in Chinese culturalism, this hierarchical dichotomy between Chinese self and non-Chinese other relates to the concept of historic and non-historic people, or people with history and people without history, as put forward by Hegel and also by Leopold von Ranke. Hegel linked historicity, or having history, to his concept of reason, including script and what he called consciousness, and non-historicity to a what he called natural spirit. Similarly, Ranke assumed that peoples or races without literate cultures were non-historic and thus nations, as he said, nations in eternal standstill. Now, such concepts were introduced to Chinese thinking as part of Blunchley's writings. Blunchley actually gave Ranke's interpretation a social Darwinist twist, if you, if you like, and added nationalist political ideas. Lunchly assumed that peoples who had not been able to form strong states were non-historic peoples. Consequently, he denied such peoples the right to build their own nation states, but argued for their inclusion and assimilation in nation states founded by historic peoples. Now, Liang Tichao applied Lunchly's assignments and conceptualized the non-Chinese as non-historic races. Uh, and the Chinese as historic races. This classification of historic Chinese versus non-historic non-Chinese peoples encouraged political thinkers and historians alike to take a chauvinist approach towards non-Chinese peoples. On the one hand, they needed to differentiate the Chinese self from the non-Chinese other in order to strengthen a Chinese national identity. On the other hand, they needed to deal adequately with such otherness as the Republican government claimed the Qing Empire's territory and thus needed to legitimize the integration of non-Chinese peoples into the Republic of China. To this end, historians became complicit with politicians who pursued this aim and selectively and arbitrarily included non-Chinese people's histories into China's general histories by telling a story of assimilation. Despite the assimilation, assimilation narrative, however, the dichotomy between Chinese self and non-Chinese other was maintained. And let me come to my hopefully short conclusion. So fundamentally, the assimilation theory depends on a belief in the inherent Chinese cultural superiority. This belief enabled late imperial thinkers to rescue a faltering Chinese identity in a state whose national and territorial sovereignty had been repeated, repeatedly compromised by waves of imperialist aggression. They drew on the difference of the non-Chinese other to ascertain the superiority of the Chinese self. Republican historians then arbitrarily included the, history, the histories of non-Chinese peoples as part of national Chinese history to help political leaders, consciously or unconsciously, retain the full extent of Qing territory against waves of successionist movements while excluding non-Chinese peoples from the project of nation building. Agamben's logic of exclusive inclusion can help us understand why generations of Chinese political leaders ever since Sun Yat-sen discriminated against their non-Chinese citizens while trying to hijack their histories and identities by inventing and constructing minority Minzu identities and histories and ultimately colonizing their land despite mostly not sharing the same level of deprivation suffered by Agamben's Homo Zatza, who is eternally captured in a state of exception in a concentration camp, non-Chinese peoples have indeed been excluded from a community of the Chinese self through socioeconomic and ethnocultural discrimination. Moreover, reports of the last three years 
about more than 1 million Uyghurs and other Muslim peoples being detained in so-called re-education camps indicate a worrying change of the situation towards Agamben's case of the homo zatza in an eternal state of exception. Thank you very much. While allowing uh, the chat to fill up with some questions, I will ask uh, a question or two. Um, so, so about uh, historic and non-historic uh, races, let's say if I were a, a nationalist Qing, uh, or nationalist Republican historian, uh, it, it, I would have found it quite easy to argue that like the Miao or the Hani, uh, who it seems like maybe just weren't even on the radar uh, for these historians were, were non-historic peoples. But something like the Tibetans who had, you know, had writing for like a thousand years and, uh, <laughs> and had at one point actually conquered the Chinese capital, it's, it would seem quite hard to ar argue, that, you know, just based on these criteria, like, well, they have a script, and they have a history and they formed a strong nation. So I'm curious, did anyone try to actually sort of argue the case despite that evidence or was it just sort of somehow seen through or brushed to the side? I would say that usually it's just brushed aside. Um, so as I try to explain, the, the histories of the non-Chinese people were not really told in, the general history, in these general histories. So they were only told in so far as they are related to Han Chinese, I'm using this term, a Han Chinese history or what the, the, the historians understood as real Chinese history, which is basically Han Chinese history. They would usually not tell the history of Tibet as that of an, like that of an independent country or, an indep or, or having an independent history at all. Um, so also not, also for the others, they would not tell the Manchus history from before Qing times, but history would only begin usually with the conquest of Beijing or maybe with the founding of the Qing in 1636, but they were not really interested in their real, if you want, real history. I mean, this idea of not having script and therefore being non-historic is of course an idea that we still find today, right? It's, uh, um, I think it's still a very, very common approach to, to not take oral history very seriously uh, in, histo in, in history studies. Um, so, but in case of the Republican historians, I think it's a, a conscious or unconscious um, ignorance or ignoring the histories of these people, no matter if they were Tibetans or Miao, actually, it, it's no difference to them. So just put simply then like the, 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 the to us blatant contradiction that you're saying uh, a people is uh, non-historic who, for instance, just does have a script and everyone would know it had a script. Um, just it, it, th there, was, there was no constituency who felt it necessary to point out that contradiction. Yeah. No, usually not. <laughs> There's a question by Yushu, who's two questions. Did you come across any discussion on marriage between Chinese and non-Chinese people in these general histories? What's the place of women in these general histories? And not what do you think this absence of gender could reveal? What's the place of overseas Chinese in these general histories writing? Um, okay, let me first answer the question about marriage. Now marriage, um, yeah, I could have actually mentioned that in the, uh, when I talked about the general culturalist understanding of assimilation. So in most, um, a, a lot of historians don't actually say in detail what they mean by assimilation. They would usually refer to uh, the well-known uh, <laughs> um, uh, emperors of the Northern Way who adopted Chinese family names, for example. This would be the, the all of them would refer to this one story. Um, and of course, they would also refer to marriage between, or would sometimes refer to marriage between non-Chinese emperors, for example, to, to Chinese wives as a sign of their assimilation. Now they would not explain in detail why marrying a Chinese means assimilation to the Chinese. And they would also not explain in detail why um, adopting Chinese style administration means assimilation into the Chinese. So this would always remain rather hazy. That's what I meant by, by calling this a 
by referring to the haziness of the concept, it's actually not a very clear concept because it isn't, it isn't thoroughly explained or analyzed what assimilation concretely means in history as well as in, in the contemporary times when these histories were written. So marriage would be mentioned, but in general, women, um, <laughs> I didn't come across a, women as crucial parts of these general histories. Um, well, I think this absence of gender is nothing particular uh, to Chinese general histories, but I think this is something you will find in probably all general histories around the globe at that time, because gender or women as active parts of, of history were just not um, discovered, let's say, or they were just not considered to be of any importance. Sometimes um, women as leaders, for example, in among the Kitan in particular, were mentioned as um, referring to their barbarian state. So as you might know, the Kitan people in the Liao dynasty had quite a few powerful females as empresses um, and as leaders. Um, but that would usually be used in order to argue for their barbarity and not for their for them being civilized. But I can't say that this is a very uh, an issue that is touched by a lot of historians. It's it's rather a, a marginal a marginal point. Um, overseas Chinese, I'm sorry, I didn't look into that at all, um, and it didn't. I didn't. I don't think it's it had a lot of. Um, it was a very. It's a very important part of general histories. They might have one little chapter on, on overseas Chinese in their uh, chapters on, um, at their time, contemporary history, but usually that's not an important um, part of their histories. Um, yeah, so um, Isabella asks, how did these ideas about ethnic nationalism relate to the adoption of the five nation flag with stripes reflecting the five major ethnic groups? This flag was not favored by all Republicans. I, yeah, Sun Yat-sen, I said that in my talk, but it was adopted by the Young Republic, so reflected some ideas about how ethnic groups should be integrated into the nation. Yeah, this is actually an, uh, some kind of an ambivalent um, feeling that among, among the young Chinese nationalists or, or the, in the Chinese nationalists in the Young Republic, let me put it like that. And um, so on the one hand, they, I mean, the um, Mongolia and Tibet, of course, broke away from, from the Qing Empire and from the Republic of China rather immediately, immediately before and immediately after the Republic of China had been declared. So um, it was rather obvious to uh, Republican nationalists that there was uh, um, this danger of separatism. Mm. So they were, on the one hand, they were anxious to show to these people that they would include them in their nation state and in their concept of the Chinese Republic, um, symbolized by the flag. Um, however, this flag was really mainly, a, was a, um, didn't really reflect their political ideas. Um, and we can see that the powerful um, politicians of that time, like, like Sun Yat-sen and others, um, either they didn't have any time at all to think about these people because, I mean, they were very occupied with the dis disastrous situation of, of the Chinese, um, of China proper, um, and they couldn't really occupy themselves with what was happening in Tibet, Mongolia, Xinjiang, Manchuria, Manchuria etc. But um, those of them who did think about these regions would, nearly all of them would argue for their inclusion and in order to stabilize this inclusion and to prevent future um, separatisms of these regions, nearly all of them would also argue for uh, active assimilation policies in these regions. Um, but this comes to the fore in, in the sources I have studied, the general histories only indirectly because these are not political handbooks, but these are um, history textbooks, of course. Um, there is a question by Hannah, which came before Isabella's, and let me shortly refer to this question. How do you feel that Liang Qichao's ideas of nationalism, Chinese superiority and assimilation have inspired modern day PRC assimilation policies and nationalist education? Um, my feeling is yes. I haven't tried to, to, to show this connection 
um, by, I don't know, looking at PRC history textbooks myself uh, and looking, for example, at how are these things phrased, how are they narrated, is it very similar? But I know that a lot of Republican history textbooks um, and also cultural histories, particularly, for example, Yui Zheng's Zhongguo Wenhua Shi, are used until today as textbooks at university and also school education. So textbooks from Republican times with their rather Sinocentric approach to China's history are still used and are obviously found um, not found problematic um, in, in um, national education in the PRC. So I do think that Liang Zhuqiao directly or indirectly had a strong impact on how um, history and particularly history of non-Chinese people has been interpreted um, also in PRC times and probably also uh, in the Republic of China on Taiwan today. I'd like to um, uh, ask uh, also a final question about uh, the constitution of territoriality, where, let's say, let's put it this way, if I were a Chinese nationalist, I've always thought that I would say, well, the Evenki, you know, who were in kind of outer Manchuria, they're uh, one of our Minzu, and so are the Ryukyuans. Uh, and, you know, the, the, uh, at, at after the, the, the Sino-Gorka War, there were Ambans stationed in Kathmandu. So, of course, you know, Kathmandu, uh, Nepal is, uh, uh, you know, an inviolable part of the Chinese nation. Um, how, how did the, the particular uh, imagination of the Qing's territoriality sort of come to be stabilized and how is it represented in, in these textbooks? Um, you mean how it's argued that the Qing Empire's territory is China? Oh, I even mean how do they know what's part of the Qing Empire? <laughs> That's a very good question, actually. Um, so usually, um, uh, well, Liang Qiao and, and the texts in late Qing times, um, in my reading, usually refer, already begin this, this pan-ethnic understanding to to repeat, on the one hand, repeat this pan-ethnic understanding of, of China or the Qing Empire, which is, of course, so Manchus, Mongols, Chinese, Tibetans, Turkic Muslims, um, and, their inhabit and the regions inhabited by them. They don't, uh, and they use, of course, also the, the, um, the names for the administrative regions used by the Qing. So, for example, um, they would use the term Xinjiang, or they would use the, the older term Tianshan Nanlu, Tianshan Beilu for this, for this region. They would use the term Zhang or Xizang for Tibet, um, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's rather, again, I have to say, it's like the assimilation theory. It remains rather hazy. It's not, you can't really pin it down. And in the general histories, we see something else. We see, um, uh, on the one hand, something similar. So the reference to the Qing Empire with the, the, the 18 provinces, uh, Manchuria, and then again the four other regions, Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet, and um, Xinjiang. Um, but we also see some references to, to the Yuan Empire, where we have this idea of oh, China could be even bigger than the Qing Empire. So the Mongols, it, so you can find formulations like the Mongols unified China. Of course, a very interesting idea of the Yuan dynasty on the one hand and of China on the other hand. So I think at that time for late imperial thinkers, but to a certain degree also for, for Republican historians, the, the territory of China isn't entirely clear. Um, and it's never made that clear. The, the reason why Korea you know, isn't part of China is because the Qing didn't incorporate it in its in its in its own ethnic theory. Is your you know? Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, Zhang Taiyan, a, a famous uh, political thinker and historian and scholar in general of late Qing times, but then also Republican times, wrote his famous text um, Zhonghua Jie in 1907. And in this text, he actually does refer to Korea and Vietnam, and he develops this interesting theory, saying, um, well. The final aim should of us nationalists should be to integrate Korea and Vietnam and actually to liberate them from their colonial oppress oppressors. But before we do that, it's probably easier to, to, um, to, to stabilize our own, um, our own 
territory with Xinjiang, Tibet, and Mongolia and assimilate those people. And when we have managed that, we can also take Korea and Vietnam who are culturally so much closer to us. So they do have that in mind, mm -hmm. but I think after the, the downfall of the, or after the abdication of the last Qing emperor and the establishment of the Republic, Vietnam and Korea somehow seem to not to be in the focus anymore. Probably also for very practical reasons. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for this talk, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us. Okay. Uh, then I guess I will say goodbye and thank you again, and then uh, I will shut this off.